what I wanted to share and get feedback on is uh, some ideas that have been developing over the last few years. Already we talked about some of this last time um, about the relationship between machine learning and physics based learning. And uh, so the, the, the sort of the, there'll be three main areas that have been going through my mind. One has to do with metrics and evaluation, which I'm not going to talk about today. Um, but more broadly, I've been driven by this thing about uh, people concerned about whether you can trust what a machine learning model is saying. And so it has to do with this issue of interpretation. But also when you say trust, there's another dimension of that, and that's got to do with generalizing. Right? So this we sort of come together here. Um, you guys know this, so I'll just mention very quickly um, where my background and interests are. Uh, but I do want to say something about the fact that everything has been informed by my interest in information theory and also the conversations we've been having in this group, primarily with the weed of course, to the larger group. And uh, when we talk about information theory, we, we uh, traditionally think about, the first thing most people get exposed to is Shannon information. And I'm gonna condense Shannon information down into one sound light, which is you wanna minimize conditions. There's a lot more to it, but that's how we think of Shannon information. In other words, um, Conditioned on all of my knowledge of physics or patterns or whatever, once I take all that out, what's left is the part that um, I won't say is random, but is unpredictable because you don't, have the, you don't know what to use to predict it. And so the part that's unpredictable you want to be as less unpredictable as possible, that's what you find a surprise. And then uh, Kolmogorov and uh, Solomonov and Chaitan came along and they said, yes, but there's another dimension to information that's algorithmic information. And uh, not only do we want to minimize condition surprise, but we also want to minimize condition complexity. So we want the shortest description of the system, which gives the same level of surprise. We think of it that way, okay? Uh, the shortest algorithm, in their case, they call it uh, the program and run through the shortest program run through a Turing machine gives the answer. But basically, we think of this as the principle of parsimony. Um, and okay, so uh, you can you can figure out the algorithm, and then on top of that, you can figure out the structure of the uncertainty, and then together you have uh, minimum algorithmic information. Minimum conditional complexity, minimum conditional supports. Okay. Um, but we're still left with one more problem, which is that even once you have come up with a description of the system, uh, it turns out that in general there are many, many ways you could describe that same system, which have the same minimum level of complexity and same minimum conditional spreads. So we get into this thing, and I don't have a better name for it, so I invented this one, I'm going to call it public representation information. And I think this is particularly important for us because um, when we get into machine learning, almost the key thing about machine learning is figuring out how to build representations. What is the representation you need to choose? And the, our, our arguments are about uh, whether we should use machine learning representation, or physics-based representation, hybrid representation, so uh, this is my hand waving. I'm going to call this maximize structural interpretability and maximize generalization ability. And part of that is transferability. So that's the part I've been trying to dig into and say that we understand the first two very well. I don't think we understand this third part as, as well as I would like to. Um, it's general talk, so you guys know about this. This is our information theory group. Uh, that gets to the other I don't have to say a lot about that. All right, so um, one of the things I always try to do when I give talks and lectures is I try to boil it down into what they say uh, learning is compression. So this is my compressed definition <laughs> of the goal of science. Um, and that is to discover a representation, including embedding, the important part, that is interpretable and with minimal 
minimal conditional complexity. Uh, and we can get into discussions as to whether that's descriptive complexity or computational complexity, those are different aspects of complexity. And that results in minimal predictive surprise, that was Shannon. Uh, good generalization ability, well, uh, in other words, uh, when tested against reality, well, should I do that? Um, and this is sort of an extension of algorithmic Polygorov, uh, you know, Chaitan, someone off idea that if you build a minimal description, then it should generalize well. It's an extension of their idea. Um, and then I want to add the third element, which is it supports and facilitates scientific reasoning. So um, we don't, uh, we want to use these things to help us learn about that system, but we also want us to help us do science and discovery and learn about you know, most of life. So that's my, um, that's my um, two-bit definition of the goal of science. And we could take any one of these words over there and do a deep dive <laughs> into it. Okay. So today I just want to focus more on um, uh, interpretability, uh, which has to do with the supports and facilitates scientific reasoning and generalization ability, which and I think these are very closely tied together. <laughs> uh, so let me first talk about generalization ability. Typically, the language we use is in sample, out of sample. And I think that's a particularly bad language to use. So here's, here's the way I look at it. Um, I think of generalization ability as being in time or space, time and or space. Uh, you're assuming you've got a stationary conditional data generating process, conditional because it's conditional on inputs that are coming in, it's not a closed system. And um, once you've got a stationary conditional data generating process, that we assume that the canvas data set represents hydrology as a data generating process and it's distributed in space and it evolves over time. I'm assuming that the underlying physics and uh, hydrological principles that drive that system are stationary. They don't change okay, as you go as you move around in space and as you go backwards and forwards in time. Okay. And there we can think about interpolation, where we are within the range represented by the data, training data, and you can think about extrapolation, where you move beyond the range represented by the training data. And I'll draw little cartoons to illustrate these. So I might call the first one first order generalization ability. Um, and you might say it's not even generalization, but yeah, it is because you're interpolating. And then the second I'm going to call second order generalization ability because I want to go outside of the range of what's represented by my data. Then you might say, yes, I've got the system. Thank you. Then you might say, yes, I've got this system, but human beings uh, change it by putting in parking lots and stuff like that, so there's structural change. Or the system actually is not stationary, it actually evolves because climate erodes the land surface and vegetation grows and you've got climate change. Okay. So uh, you could think of that as having two dimensions. One is changes in structural form. Uh, or alternatively changes to the algorithmic complexity of that system. Okay, so the description length changes of that system. Okay. And I'm going to call that third order generalization ability. And then you might want to then generalize even further to isomorphically similar systems. So systems that have dynamics, that have spatial temporal variability, but are not hydrologic systems might be something else, okay. vegetation systems or something where you go, that kind of is like that, but it's not the same system. And some, some of these systems might be similar in many aspects, but they might also be dissimilar in many aspects. And I'm going to call that higher order generalization ability. And presumably, we as human beings think of this as intelligence, the ability to abstract from one situation and learn principles and apply them in a different situation. So probably there's other ways to do this, but this is the way I'm thinking about this. And just to illustrate, okay, 
And then I'm going to argue that in order to achieve good interpolation, you don't need interpretability in principle. You can do it without it. But as you go down this, uh, this hierarchical level of generalization ability, you're going to need, uh, interpretability is going to help you. You're going to want more and more interpretability, but I still haven't defined interpretability. So we'll talk about that. So um, this is just a cartoon. I've got some data, X and Y. And let's say there's a data generating process that lives somewhere in this space and it's fixed. And I don't know what it is, but let's say I didn't know what it was. This, this represents the extent of that. And now I have location in, in, in data space, and that's this one location. And um, it's going to be hard to learn the full nature of the data generating process from data at a single location. So you, can, you take one camel's location, you're not going to learn everything you want to learn about hydrology from that one location. Okay. Now you might be able to take two or several locations and you might be able to learn how to interpolate in this data space. Okay. Um, but because the data generating process is going to occupy this very complex manifold in data space, it's probably you're probably going to not do very well at extrapolation. Okay. Unless the underlying data uh, contains enough information about the principles underlying this data generating process, which then allow you to extract those principles and extrapolate. Okay. So this might be possible. And so you might say, I've got enough catchments, locations that I can learn the underlying physics of hydrology and so now I can extrapolate outside of my data range. That's the idea of this, this cartoon. Um, but typically, our data sets may, are not going to be fully representative of the data generating process. So let's assume this is the data that I have that occupies this part of the space. Um, and also, those data may be distribution biased. So whereas this kind of captures this banana shape, it's quite possible that over here it doesn't capture the banana shape. And, and so now if I if I try to extrapolate using information pulled out of this subset of catchments, I might go back to the same problem of not being able to extrapolate. That's the idea. Yeah. This is just a cartoon. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, then you might have structural changes to the system. So now the data generating process has moved. Right. That's the idea here. Uh, and so you want to be able to somehow learn from the original data generating process from samples. And then you want to be able to say, okay, now I've made a structural change to the system. I want to be able to predict how this uh, form of the data generating process changes. Okay. And that would be structural. Type. And, and, and uh, this is where I think interpretability becomes important. And then you might want to do generalization by abstraction. So let's say there's my data generating process. I somehow fit a model, it's not perfect, uh, but now I've got a new and isomorphic system, which has a data generating process, which is in some sense isomorphic here and rotated it. And I could take that model and with some appropriate uh, set of transformations, I can move from one regime to another. Okay. So, uh, and I just put this in because uh, I'm not even sure I would have thought about this if I hadn't read about the book by Herman Hess. Yeah. That's what I feel. Yeah. This, this is exactly yeah. what he's talking about in his book about uh, the, uh, the power of abstraction. So, anyway, great book. Okay. So the general problem is we somehow want to learn from both data and theory. More specifically, we want to construct representations that characterize system dynamics. We're focusing on dynamics. Uh, and in the context of geosciences, we want these representations to generalize. And I've given a bunch of examples of generalization. So uh, prediction, uh, characterizing dominant processes, learning uh, generic representations like on camels, regionalizing, um, generalizing under changing climate or land use, or just being interpretable so that you can support decision making. And then, so you want to be able to generalize and you want to be able to reason. 
So you want to be able to say, um, something changes, what do I expect will change? So that's not, that's also a kind of prediction, like scenario analysis is a kind of prediction. Okay, our specific domain is uh, hydrology, catchments, uh, specific example, specially distributed, some kind of hypothesis uh, about its structure. And then the generalization problem in this case is uh, as an example, is the spatial generalization problem. I'm not going to address climate right now, but just as an example, right? And so the idea here is that we take all these catchments uh, across the continental US, and the assumption is that there's some underlying data generating process we're trying to discover, but that um, the, the generals are the same across space, but the specifics vary. And I want to learn, I want to be able to learn how to vary the specifics and that's sort of the prediction and application business problem. Okay, um, some desirable attributes, we want them to be learnable, we want them to be regionalizable or generalizable. Um, oh, the illustration I like here is to say it's a dynamical system, so you might think of cats as being dynamical systems, and then you've got types of cats. The behavior of this type of cat might be different from that. So they all they're all in the category of cats, but you want to be able to predict that this cat will behave differently from that cat. Mm -hmm. right. So we must somehow be able to recognize a particular class or a subclass. Okay. And we want to be interpretable. And the question is, what does this mean? Is it the same as explainable? My claim is no. And what's the relationship to reasoning? Okay. All right, so that was sort of a long introduction to say interpretability is important. So what does it mean for representation to be interpretable? Um, everything I've dug into uh, before this leads me to make this claim. It has to be based in a language that makes sense to me. In other words, some, if, if I speak to you in a language you don't recognize, you can't interpret what I'm saying. So that's the foundation of it, okay? And what is an alphabet? An alphabet fundamentally consists of an alf sorry, a language fundamentally consists of an alphabet of symbols, where each symbol is given a precise interpretation. And then you create words from those symbols, and you create a dictionary of meanings, that's a vocabulary. And then you create grammatical rules that govern the syntax of how you combine those symbols together and words in order to form sentences. And then you have grammatical rules for how you combine sentences to make concepts and so on and so forth. But basically it boils down to three things, alphabet, dictionary, and, and grammar. And when you go into computer science, this is all they talk about, right? Theory of computer science is all about alphabet, dictionary, and grammar. So we can learn a lot from that. So representation, what we call a representation is arguably just a description. It's a description constructed using a particular language. And because it's constructed using that language, it's only interpretable, strictly speaking, in the context of that language. Uh, the other thing about descriptions is they facilitate abstraction. So you can combine symbols together, and then you can replace that combination of symbols with a single symbol, and then that's your abstraction. And then you can combine those together and replace with another symbol, and that's an abstraction. And that's what allows us to do higher level thinking, reasoning versus lower level. Yeah. And in computers, you see that already. You start with binary, and then you go to hexadecimal, and then you go to basic or Fortran, or well, machine, machine code, and, and then you, you, know, you go to and or not gates, and, and so you have these different hierarchies of languages. Okay. Um, and this is what I just said. So if I'm intimately familiar with the language and all of its levels of abstraction, then any description I construct using that language will in principle be interpretable by me, okay, at a particular level. And so you've got these arguments going on between uh, people like Gray and other people who are on, more on the machine learning side, they're saying, where a physical scientist comes and says, oh, but your model's not interpretable. And he says, no, it's perfectly interpretable. I understand it perfectly. I know exactly what it's doing. It's just they're speaking two different languages. 
Okay, so properties of abstractions, they result in what we call conditionally simpler representations. Um, so this is what I just said, enable more efficient representation, higher level thinking and logical comparisons. You can reduce storage and memory requirements because you take an abstraction, an idea, and you only have to store it once in your dictionary, and then you can reuse it. You just access that and you reuse it. So your description becomes shorter, but your dictionary becomes larger. And that's the trade-off we as human beings make. We construct larger dictionaries, which allow us to think about things, but then uh, that allows us to do it efficiently because we reuse those concepts. In many, many and that's where generalization comes in, right? Okay. So abstraction brings flexibility of representation. And um, here we can think about, I want to build a representation specifically for prediction and control. I don't care about understanding. That's one way to think about it. Or I can build a representation specifically for understanding and generalization, but I don't care about predictability. And in principle, I want to do both, but I may have to do some trade-offs between these aspects, okay? Um, an example of that would be, uh, you learn intuitive physics as a kid, Right? You can do really good prediction and control, cross the ball, you can understand it. You don't know anything about the physics conceptually, or you can learn the physics, but learning the physics may not improve your ability to catch a ball unless I put you in a new situation where you've never experienced that kind of wind or whatever. And then you might say, okay, I'm going to do the physics in my head, right? And I'm going to say, okay, it's going there, it's going to go there, right? So there, so there's very, there's a very strong uh, association here to me between um, things that we learn at the level of neurology and the things that we learn at the level of conceptual representation in our brain, or what I forget the name of the gentleman calls fast and slow thinking. Kahneman. Yeah, right. So there's the representation that enables fast thinking, and there's the representation that enables slow thinking, and each one has its own function and the purpose, and we take advantage of it. It's also related to encoding and decoding. Uh, language is just a system of encoding and decoding, right? Um, I have to know how to decode a description if, if I want to be able to interpret it, okay? Um, translation dictionaries are useful because I can encode in Chinese and I can decode into English, but I have to have a translation dictionary. Okay. Um, and then the choice of embedding is important, uh, where the embedding is the specific choice I make about how to take observations I make about the real world and represent them in terms of symbols, which, um, and, in, and, and in large language models is an important, is a useful example, because there you take words and you embed them as vectors of numbers and once you, so you have to choose the embedding space, right? You might have 10,000 words, but you might project it down to a 512 embedding space okay, instead of doing one hot encoding. But you have to choose the dimensionality, and then you have to choose uh, how to construct that embedding um, to resolve ambiguities, for example. But also because you want to be able to do mathematical operations on that embedding, and those mathematical operations have to make sense. So if I add two vectors, they give rise to a third vector, and that third vector has the meaning of the sum of these two vectors, and so on, right? So that's the concept of embedding. And initially, people were using word to vec and other things for constructing embeddings, and later on, people said, no, let's learn the embeddings. So they even, they even constructed machine learning algorithms for actually learning the embeddings. Right? So, arguably, that's what we do, so. Um, Okay, this is just saying that typically, because we use vector space mathematics, so we want vector space embeddings. And here I just want to point out that um, people are studying graph neural networks and want to use machine learning for that. When I was digging into that, uh, one of the things that they focused a lot on was they had to learn a different embedding space than is used by large language models, because they had to represent different kinds of attributes and properties in the embedding space, and they had to be able to do addition and multiplication and so on. So it's not a trivial thing. I would argue it is the most important thing 
is actually going to be embedded space. Because yeah. it, it determines what information is stored and uh, not about not just about things, but about relationships and those things. Okay. Um, so physics-based and machine learning-based modeling, uh, both use closely related but somewhat different languages. They're similar in the sense that they both encode the system using directed graphs. They both use the same basic mathematical operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. But they're different in the sense that machine learning has more flexibility in the receptive field. Uh, you can take all the sources of information and stick them in as inputs, and it just says, I don't care, right? Um, the dictionary of allowable operations is different. So machine learning ones are typically limited to addition, multiplication, uh, summation, sigmoid, rectified linear units, stand hyperbolics, softmax, whereas physics-based uh, uh, dictionary is much more extensive. You can use logarithms, you can use coordinate transformations, you can use trigonometric functions, you can use integration and differentiation. In principle, a machine learning system can learn these things, but then has to put a lot of effort into learning these things. Whereas if you give it a dictionary, a scientific dictionary, you've already saying it's in my dictionary, I can just take it out and use it. I don't have to learn. Um, and you could say arguably mathematics is the science of constructing languages. Yeah, arguably, uh, it, which enable you to do different things. Um, but there are interesting differences in the level of the abstraction. So they draw upon different dictionaries. Um, the grammatical rules are different. Uh, they can have different constraints on allowable operations. Like physics-based models are tend to be constrained by to obey symmetry principles. Yeah. And they're not necessarily in machine learning models. And there are people in machine learning going, okay, how do we put symmetry principles into machine learning? Uh, they tend, machine learning models tend not to distinguish between mass, energy, and information, but that's prior on physics-based models. Uh, they implement different kinds of attention. Uh, attention just means the weight I give to a different piece of information. Uh, and modern machine learning is context-dependent attention um, and different kinds of memory mechanisms. So physics-based models tend to use Markovian memory, uh, machine learning models have more flexibility in the kind of memory that they can put. And I'm just going to claim that these differences are not fundamentally necessary. There's no reason why we can't build machine learning, which uses the same grammatical rules in some physics based models. At the level of implementation, however, they're identical, right? Because they have to be boil down to not and or XOR and AND operations or finally just down to binary operations which have to be implemented in the computer. Uh, I just wanted to point out that just because we're familiar with digital computers, we should not assume that everything does digitally. Biological organisms might have different uh, internal mechanisms for coding and decoding and so on. Yeah. Um, but, but I did want to point, I, I already mentioned this, different types of tasks can be implemented at different representations levels. So prediction and control, where you really need accuracy and precision, uh, you might want to just implement at a very base level. Where you just learn the patterns and you get intuitive physics. Whereas if you want to do reasoning and generalization, you might want to learn a higher level representation, which allows you to um, generalize from one situation to another, right? Mm -hmm. uh, interesting example of this would be you learn how to walk on Earth and then suddenly you go to Mars or the Moon and you have to spend some time adapting to learning how to work, walk in a different gravity without an atmosphere or whatever, or just moving around in space, right? Yeah. Okay. So at the base level, you know, everything looks like zeros and ones, um, maybe some structure in there, okay. So the main point is, uh, for representation to be interpretable, it has to be constructed using a language that makes sense. Um, all representations are interpretable at the level of that language. Um, any machine learning model is interpretable at its particular level of abstraction. 
sphere of life. <laughs> Uh, physics and machine learning models use different dictionaries and therefore interpretable in different ways. And now, if we want to interpret machine learning based models in terms of geoscience, either we have to construct a dictionary to dictionary translator. Okay. That would be like saying, I've got all these rectified linear units uh, uh, and so on. You put them together in this pattern and it means logarithm. And you put them together in this pattern and it means sign and so on. Okay. So translating from something, you have to look for the pattern and you have to do a snap operation. Um, so, Ashwin, you are now talking with the interpretability, not about I can understand and trace what the model is doing to arrive at a result, but how this can be interpreted in terms of the system it's representing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, but also, I want to make a translation. If I see this happening over here in this language, it means this in this language. Okay. All right. Um, or you just start by building a machine learning model using interpretable components right from the get go. Right. And I'm claiming that both are going to happen. Um, uh, my guess is that what happens in the brain is you have the uh, reptilian brain and it's closer to this very base level intuitive functioning. And then you have a, 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 the midbrain and it gets signals from brain and interprets them using some kind of conceptual architecture. And then you have the upper brain, which is a third level. And what about switching it off? And I heard. And and that would be that would be equivalent to saying I build my neural network. And then I build a neural network that interprets my neural network, and then I build another neural network that interprets my neural network that's interpreting my neural network. Um, or you can construct using interpretable components, and, and that's perhaps a little bit easier, but I think long run, we're going to do both. Okay. Uh, the bottom is the one I've been mainly pursuing, and that's where I gave my talk about mainly last time. Okay. So, um, uh, physically based geoscientific models typically constructed to represent mass energy information flows. We use symbolic language, uh, differential equations, and we use visual language, directed graphs. These are the two most common ones that we use to talk about. So when we say it's interpretable, this is what we show people and say, hey, look, I can understand this. Of course, we go through a whole bunch of steps. You know, we build a perceptual conceptual representation. That's the embedding problem. Uh, we build a conceptual representation, another level of embedding. Then we build mathematical representations. Then we build algorithms. So we go through this cycle of steps. Yeah. So system conceptualization just means I draw my boundary. Uh, I've got input drivers. I've got unobserved losses, observed outputs. I've got some system state or memory. And by doing this, I've basically said, this is my attention problem. I'm choosing how I attend to my system, and I'm choosing what inputs are important and what I can ignore, and what outputs are important and what I can ignore. That's my receptive field. Uh, then I choose some system architecture. Um, this is the architectural detail problem. Uh, notice no parameters involved, I'm just saying, these things are states, and these are the things that I'm going to track and they evolve in time, and that's what you talked about just now. Um, I want to mention that there is already quite a bit of work in uh, robotics and machine learning on learning these architectures. Okay, we haven't dug into it yet, but I'm very interested. In There's uh, things that people have uh, developed which allow you to actually grow the neural network, to grow the directed graph architecture in a reasonable way. Okay. Then we take these architectures and we put gates on these uh, flows, and then we say, okay, I'm gonna learn the form of these gates, okay? And we, so we put in, so this is the functional representation problem in physics. We think of these as the process equations. In uh, machine learning, we think of these as gates. And we can put constraints on these to impose conservation. 
And the, uh, basically, we're talking about these as like conductivities. So you've got a flow and I've got a conductivity. And I have to learn the form of that conductivity. Okay. And then you could say, in physics, I, I prescribe these, or I might prescribe the form of these, and then I can learn them using a machine learning architecture to do the learning. So you could say these are all learnable gating functions. And they have weights, and I can then train this using backpropagation or any other method. And I showed you some examples of this. We can run the gates, and the gates are in principle interpretable. Okay, I can always go back to this if anybody has questions. And then we did uh, some comparisons where um, uh, what I'm showing you is a distribution of annual performances at a single catchment, with one being the best answer is this is KG instead of NSC. Um, and uh, um, here I'm representing the system using a single cell state mass conserving perceptron and um, uh, using different hypotheses about the architectures and saying, how does that performance improve as I change my hypothesis? And then I just want to compare this to, to a pure machine learning uh, your, uh, LSTM. And the idea is, uh, uh, this is a single state model with different architectures. This is increasing numbers of cell states, one, two, up to five. And by imposing a physical, physically interpretable language on the model, we can still get performances not that far off from a purely machine learning model. Uh, this one might be more interesting to you. Uh, so on the left, we've got LSTMs, which are data neural networks with increasing numbers of cell states, two, three, five, and six. And you can see that uh, after about three to five cell states, the performance doesn't really improve. Okay, and then over here are some conceptual rainfall runoff models where they're the standard models, uh, PyMod, uh, GR4J, Sacramento model with different numbers of cell states indicated here. And you can see that their performance of the conceptual models is, as we already know, much worse than LSTMs, even though they have larger numbers of cell states. Uh, and then there's the mass conserving architecture where I've gone from one to three cell states, but three cell states with different kinds of architectures, hypotheses about how they're organized. And you can see we're approaching the performance of LSTM, with, uh, which is a purely database. That's the basic idea. All right, but that's at a single location. And we really want to be able to take this dynamical representation and we want to then generalize in space. So the hub problem. Yeah. So um, now I'm switching to the work done by Luis, which is not a mass conserving architecture, but he's using a different kind of architecture, which is a modification of LSTM he calls hydro LSTM. And uh, the hydro LSTM, the gates have parameters, the weights, it should say weights, not ways. And it turns out that those weights he showed have patterns in the sequence patterns and that they vary spatially. Okay. And um, what do I mean by patterns? So the weights are uh, attention weights given to different lags on inputs. So you're feeding different lags of precipitation, different lags of temperature or whatever. And at different locations, these are three different locations, um, you can see that uh, there are different patterns to the weighting. It's like an antecedent precipitation index. How much weight do I give to current precipitation, the one time step lag, two time step lag, three time step lag kind of thing. Okay. And the red is temperature and the blue is uh, precipitation. And these are variations over 20 random initializations of the training of the model, single cell state model. And so he just discovered that there were patterns. So he said, what can I do with these? And so he takes those patterns and he trains his model on all the, cat, uh, sorry, uh, all but some left out catchments in the uh, CONUS region. And then he does k-means clustering on them, and he discovered that there are something like five patterns, you could say, broadly speaking. So these are kind of like expected values of these taken over many catchments and then clustered. And so you could see that catchments that belong to this red cluster 
have a different weighting pattern than, say, catchments belonging to the blue cluster. Okay. That's the idea behind this. And if you plot, plot those uh, spatial distributions of clusters, this is one model trained at each location independently without using spatial attributes or anything, just, just single model trained. Okay. You see some patterns, right? So cluster two, that red one, uh, is mostly associated with these high elevation regions and blue and in these regions and then green and so on. Okay. So that suggests that there's something interesting we can learn. Okay. And so uh, what, uh, what Luis did was that he said, okay, I'm going to add to this uh, hydro LSTM, which is this part, I'm going to learn a classification architecture. I'm going to use something where I'm going to train it with static attributes coming in, and I'm going to output the weight patterns which I want to use in my, LS, my hydro LSTM. I'm going to train it to learn how to associate the weight patterns of the hydro LSTM to the static attributes. Okay. Um, and so now if you can solve this problem, then in principle, we can learn different classes of dynamical systems, one which operates under these conditions. Okay. How does he do it? Uh, he starts by uh, training uh, 20 hydro LSTM models for catchment, a single cell state model. So it's like your bucket model. It's just got a single, single cell state uh, with time constant parameters. Okay. Uh, initially, he trains 20 of them. He first figures how many lags he needs on past values, the sequence length. He develops some initial gate, uh, weight sequence estimates, and then he averages those over the 20 random initializations. Um, he takes those average gate weight sequences, feeds them back to every catchment. Uh, sorry, at, at each catchment, he's got 20 random initializations. He learns the gate weight sequences, averages them, feeds them back, trends them again, okay, so that he tries to take out some of the noise due to initialization, initially runs, trains for another 20 epochs. And then he feeds that into a regional random forest model where it tries to predict those gate weight sequences using static attributes. So it tries to learn this, okay. And then he takes the gate weight sequences that are learned by the random forest, feeds them back into the um, hydro LSTM, trains it again from that initial point, sends the answers back to the random forest, and he does this uh, 15 times. And uh, in the process, the gate weight sequences start to cluster together. So there's the hydro LSTM, there's the random forest. Notice that we can't backpropagate through this entire system because you can't backpropagate through the random forest. So you're doing backpropagation through hydro LSTM, but you're doing classical um, uh, random forest training on the random forest. And that's why it's kind of like expectation maximization. You fix one, you optimize the other using a different technique, then you put it back in and you iterate. And so now he's built a decision tree um, uh, uh, model, and this decision tree provides interpretability. So uh, this is just an illustration. So you feed in your static features, you predict the gate weights, and you look at the decision tree and you say, which is the static feature that gives me the first level of separation is the most important one, what's the one that's at the second level, and so on and so forth. And you, so you figure out the rules for clustering uh, by looking at the uh, random forest. And so now, um, you, now you have a bunch of leaf nodes. In this case, he's got one, two, three, four, five or six leaf nodes. And now you uh, uh, map those onto your um, uh, uh, regional map. And now you see it's not much much more, um, much less noisy than the original map. Uh, Uwe, you didn't see the original map. Let me show you that one here. Okay. This is the one where we did not impose the random forest uh, regional learning pattern on it. 
Yeah, Sanika and me stared at many of these mm -hmm. cluster maps during her master thesis. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. The last one you showed looks pretty good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And more, not only do you get clusters, but now you can see what the weight, the weighting that's given to different, uh, so it tells you what that uh, gate weight pattern looked like in different clusters. Okay. In other words, each of these clusters represents a different kind of dynamics, subclass of dynamical systems within a broad, a single broad class of dynamical systems. Um, okay. Now, um, of course, we've given up performance. Okay, so the regional uh, hydro LS, uh, sorry, the regional LSTM, sort of the one that was trained by Freddie, would be this red line. This is retrained by Luis, but it's basically the same thing. That means you don't put a constraint on number of cell states. You just learn to do prediction. And that's that one. Um, we've lost performance. If you, if you went to calibrating each catchment independently with a single cell state hydro LSTM, so you're only allowing one memory state, you've lost performance, but you've gained interpretability. And when you go to the regional model, you've lost a little bit more performance. Okay? But the trade-off is now you learn regional interpretability as opposed to local interpretability. Now, that does not mean that he could not go back and say, okay, let me put in a two cell state LS, hydro LSTM or more. But this is, this is just what he's done so far by assuming that I'm only going to track one um, descriptor of how wet the catching is. Um, here you get some interesting interpretability. So here's a snowy catchment. Uh, how do we know it's a snowy catchment? This uh, brown, uh, uh, sorry, orange line over here is temperature. It's inverted, and you can see it goes below freezing during this period of the year. This is precipitation. Okay, so there's my frozen period. This blue line is the cell state. So you notice that the cell state increases during this period. It stays more or less constant. The stream flow is very low. That's the dashed line. Okay, um, and then the stream flow increases here. So this is what we're trying to match, okay, the stash line. The gate state remains uh, more or less closed during this period because there's no snow melt coming out. So it says stay closed, okay. And then it starts to open up and the gate state increases and that's when you get stream flow being formed, okay. So in this case, you can interpret the cell state as he calls it potential flow, but it's sort of like snow water equivalent has built up in the catchment. Okay. And the gate state is now saying how, when to open the gate and how, how far to open the gate. So that's kind of cool. And you can see that the gate opens when it gets warm. Yeah. Here's a different catchment, which is the leaf river actually, uh, which is no snow, human catchment. And now the uh, now now you can see there's no freezing going on. The cell state, which he calls potential potential flow, uh, just sort of tracks uh, what you would think of as how wet the catchment is. And the gate state also goes up and down, basically saying you know uh, uh, when it's wet, open when it's when it's dry, close it off. So it's not behaving like a snow dominated catchment. It's behaving like a non snow. Okay. So if you would plot these two in a scatter plot, would it look like a you no know, soil moisture dependent hydraulic conductivity curve? Yeah. Uh, yeah, because the gate state here is primarily dependent on how wet the catchment is. Whereas in this case, the gate is not dependent primarily on the cell state, it's dependent on some external factor, in this case temperature. So uh, the result, I'm going to argue, is an interpretable representation for dynamical systems that can be trained using machine learning and big data is what we're looking for. Um, but this, to me, is actually what I, what I believe is Luis's main contribution, that it's a way of learning a representation of dynamical systems and then subcategorizing it into classes of dynamical systems so that you can distinguish between different kinds of cats. That to me is 
really amazing. I, I mean, it's, I, I think his insight in coming into this was just really wonderful. Um, okay, so I'll just wrap up by saying, you know, so there's a, there's a goal. Um, we want it to be interpretable, minimal complexity, minimal predictive surprise, we can improve on that, good generalization ability. I haven't demonstrated that, but hopefully uh, I've convinced you that there is a sort of supports and facilitates scientific reasoning, at least. Uh, we have to, you know, we have to prove this more, but uh, it's sort of there in the results. Um, that I think it's important for us to keep this in mind when we're building models, the different kinds of generalization ability we want. Uh, we want our models to be learnable, regionalizable, and interpretable. Um, we have to be uh, cognizant of the language we use and the level of abstraction we use. And there's, in principle, I feel like there's no reason why we can't build models that are consistent with each other, but are represented at different levels of abstraction, so that when you want to do one task, you use the one that predicts better, and when you want to use another task, you use a version of it that's more interpretable, and that they're somehow mutually consistent. Uh, there's some publications that uh, you guys can look at. And then I just found this nice quote by, oops, you can't see it. It says, Galileo Galilei says, the universe is written in mathematical language and its characters are triangles, circles, and other geometric figures without which it's impossible to humanly understand a word. Without these, one is wandering in a dark labyrinth. Thank you. Okay. Then thanks again for presenting. Also again to Manuel. Um, Time-wise, I could say whoever wants could join us to go to the Mensa for lunch to continue discussions. Sure. Thanks also to all those who attended online. I'll stop recording now. Erwin, you're from the leash. And um, I hope to see you soon next Same time. Here. Bye. Hi, thank you for your talk. <laughs>